Hi everyone, welcome to English at Work in Asia job interviews. Thank you so much for taking time uh, to join us for this live Q&A session on a Friday. Today we have with us two recruitment experts, Ms. Amy Young and Mr. Matthew Fitch from the British Council, which is the UK's worldwide organization promoting cultural relations and education opportunities. Uh, Ms. Amy Young is the Regional Recruitment Manager of the East Asian Region for British Council Recruits and uh, she recruits teachers and management staff across East Asia for British Council teaching centers. She is responsible for all stages within the recruitment life cycle for the onboarding of teachers across the region. Mr. Matthew Fitch, the recruitment manager of the East Asian Region for British Council, you have such long titles, <laughs> is a specialist <laughs> recruitment consultant with experience from numerous industries, including the banking, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, logistics, educational, just to name a few. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this live session and agreeing to do this live session with us today, um, especially because it's a Friday evening in Singapore. How are you two no doing problem. today? Yeah, we're doing really well. Thank you very much. Thank you for, thank you for um, doing this for our English at Work in Asia MOOC students. Uh, we have them joining uh, from all over the world, and they're eager to hear from your vast experience. So to kick off this live session, let's start with a video question by Steve in Cameroon. Hello, the English and Work in Asia Part 2 staff. I just have a little question for the live discussion forum. I wish to know if you could provide us with some tips you think would help in, in trying to reduce the stress you can have in preparing for a job interview because mastering everything you need to do is quite easy but you know handling the stress with the guy standing in front of you and the jury looking at you isn't always easy so do you have some tips you could help us with thanks all right so what Steve asked is, can you provide us with some tips you think would help in trying to reduce the stress uh, one can have during a job interview, especially when you have the interviewer sitting there in front of you, and or maybe a whole panel of interviewers sitting in front of you? Uh, sure, sure. So I think there are quite a few things that you can try to do to reduce your stress in the run up to the interview and then during the interview itself because it can be a really stressful thing to go through especially if you don't do it very often and it's a really challenging thing to go through. Um, I think the way to reduce stress begins even way before the interview when you're first told about it and you're first looking to begin your preparation. So I would advise to begin your preparation for the interview as early as you possibly can. Make sure you make full use of the few days that you're given. You want to do things like reading and rereading the role profile or the job description of the job that you're going for and thinking about yourself and your own background and maybe how you are able to meet the demands of this job because a lot of the questions that you're going to face they're going to be related to the role profile itself. And then you want to be doing other things if possible as well, things like reading through the news, looking into the company's website and basically trying to get as much information or as many talking points as you can about the company so that on the day you feel well aware of what are the, some of the things that the industry is going through, what are some of the talking points about that particular company, are they doing well, not so well and so on. And start to get this kind of information gathering going as early as possible. Um, that doesn't even just have to be reading things, but you could also try to find people either from your network or friends of friends, maybe people who've worked in a similar sector before or have maybe done a similar job before and start to talk to them about what are some of the key talking points in that area of work that you're going for and start to familiarize yourself with the key problems. So once you've done a bit of preparation, you also want to maybe think a little bit about um, your own experience and the, the sort of the key achievements that you've made in your previous jobs and start to make sure that you are aware of the main talking points and start to build up a, a good understanding of what were the things that you achieved, why were they difficult, what were some of the obstacles that you had to overcome because these are some good things that are going to equip you with examples to give during the interview itself. So make sure that you know your own background really, really well would be one of my key pieces of advice. Um, on, on the day of the interview itself, some things that you can do to maybe relieve the potential stress 
Um, certainly plan your route to the interview. Leave yourself plenty of time to get there because if you're running late or if you're flustered when you arrive, you're immediately going to be on the back foot and you're going to be feeling a little bit more stressed than usual. Um, I would normally recommend working out where the vicinity of the interview is and trying to get yourself there for about maybe 10 minutes or so before the interview is due to take place getting into reception, getting cooled down, maybe getting a drink if there's one on offer, and just get yourself feeling quite settled. Uh, maybe when the person comes down to meet with you or when you're talking to the reception, uh, you know, try to engage, try to maybe indulge in some small talk if that's possible, and just get yourself feeling more conversational and, and more in tune with the people there. Um, and I think the other thing that might help to reduce some of the stress that you feel in the interview is just to remember why you're there and why the other people are there as well. So the interviewers that you're going to be meeting, their hope is that you're going to be someone who is suitable for the job. They don't want to meet people who aren't correct or you know who aren't a good fit for the job. So they're really hoping that you are going to be a good fit for the job that they're looking to recruit. And more often than not, they're really going to be on your side, hoping to get the right kind of answers from you. So it's not always such a confrontational or adversarial thing as you expect. The people are really on your side, really hoping for the best from you. And they're going to be asking questions on areas that you should know about, such as your own background, your own skills, and so on. And no one knows those areas better than you do. So as long as you've prepared well enough in advance and you, are, you have the right examples at the top of your mind, and you know a little bit about the company you're going for and the job that you're going for and you're sounding aware and so on, um, you really stand a fantastic chance in the interview and you shouldn't be too you shouldn't be too aware of the the um, you know the the challenging aspects yeah. of it. I think also it's a good idea to think of it not just that like they are interviewing you, you are also interviewing them as well. So mm -hmm. it should take a little bit of the pressure off. Um, and another part of your research, if you can find out who is on panel, like if who's interviewing you or who's on the panel, and do some research on those people as well, um, at least you, you have some sort of commonality to talk to them about when you first meet them as well. Yeah. Um, and Shruti from uh, India asks, how should candidates address their interviewers? Should they go for a more formal, like sir or madam, or Mr. Fitch, or Miss Young? How would you... I, I think it's... In, in, uh, certainly in the UK where I've recruited and in Singapore as well, I think going by Mr. or Mrs. Yeah. such and such would be a, a good way of going for it. But take the lead from the people that you're meeting. They might introduce themselves as John or whatever their name is at the very beginning of the interview. So just follow their lead as to whatever they introduce themselves as. But if you're in doubt or if they haven't gone through that slightly less formal introduction with you, then certainly Mr. Tay or Mrs. Smith or whatever is the case, that might be the best way. Yeah, you'll also, also you'll get that feedback from them right away. I'll, I've never introduced myself as Miss Young. I'd always say, no, 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 just call me Amy. Um, and then if I would prefer if they'd call me Amy. So you'll know right away. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, second question is, what are some common mistakes you see candidates make during interviews? Hmm. Um, I think arriving late is sometimes a very noticeable one because people often plan their day very back to back. Um, so we'll know, one, if someone shows up too early. So how Matthew said earlier, maybe 10 minutes prior is the best because if you show up half an hour before, sometimes the companies don't have meeting rooms to put you in um, and then they're a little bit left scrambled or they'll send you off for coffee or something. So just to, to kind of time it so well uh, and don't arrive late. Um, not being prepared, it's obvious when someone might come into the interview and they might not know anything about the company, they did not read the job profile um, and you know quite soon off that they don't know that they don't know much about what, what you're going to be talking about. Um, I think not elaborating on answers, so giving very short answers to some questions, um, and then the interviewer might need to do a bit more digging um, to get the what they're looking for out of the response. Is It's helpful if you're able to um, provide that straight up or elaborate more than a yes or a no. Um, I think being negative is a quite common problem that I see in interviews. So, you might have really good reasons why you're looking to leave a company, or there might be some things that you're talking about in the interview, which necessarily are a little bit negative, but whenever you come across negatively about previous bosses or previous companies or something like that, it never, it never goes well and it never gives across the right messages 
even if what you're saying is 100% justified. And I do find that sometimes people can be a little bit negative about those things. And that just gives a little bit of a warning sign to the interviewers about this person and their attitude and so on, rightly or wrongly. So I would definitely recommend phrasing the constructive criticism that you're going to give very, very carefully and thinking beforehand about what you're going to say in order to make sure that it just doesn't sound that little bit too negative. Mm -hmm. I think this is another one where I, it's a stickler one for me, but I think off the bat having a good handshake as well is important because sometimes you might even, you know, in the beginning when you're meeting them, strong handshake, but at the end as well, because sometimes it, it's, it makes you credible from the beginning if you have a nice, confident handshake. Yeah. So it's really from the time you step through the door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. I think um, the thing you mentioned about maybe bad mouthing or saying something negative about the previous employer is kind of like you wouldn't say something negative about your ex <laughs> if you're on a first yeah. date. Red <laughs> <laughs> <a> flag. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, the third question is: Are there any overused phrases that you're tired of hearing? over and over again or you hear the same you know copy and pasted from google phrases i don't know i think for me the ones that i would hear are sort of the cliches like if someone's trying to talk about weaknesses or something like that they might say i take on too much or i don't know how to say no those don't really demonstrate much to the interviewer and everybody says them so i feel like they're kind of cliche answers that try to make you sound like you're a superstar um fillers like i just did there ums or likes probably try to avoid them even though in some like in my language they're they happen to be there all the time um but i try to avoid them in an interview so well rehearsed <laughs> <laughs> um okay i just did it right there <laughs> uh, it's a, when you think about it you'll do them more <laughs> yeah okay so what what do you think when someone gives you that typical answer of, oh, um, you know, I don't know how to say no to everything, so I take on many projects? What would you think? I'd probably dig a little bit deeper and ask for examples of, of a time where, you know, why, like, why, why should you have said no in that situation? Or what was the impact that it had on you in what part of your life? Was it your personal life or was it your work life that did something fall through the cracks at that point? So I'd probably ask further questions about it. Yeah. I don't feel like in the interviews that I've been in, candidates make a lot of the same kind of <coughs> phrases and so on. So I don't feel like this is such a, an issue because every single person interviews in a slightly different way. Their personalities all come across very differently. So it's not so much the case that people are overusing certain phrases. What I would say is it's really important that you are as honest as possible, um, try to stay as positive as possible, and really what you're trying to come across is that you are well prepared, you're trying to demonstrate why you're suitable for the job, and you're trying to talk through those areas of your background. Um, just try and be as free-flowing as possible, and like Amy said, not too much with the ums and ahs and so on, but just try to be as natural, as, as loose, and as direct and honest as you can be. I think that ultimately will create the kind of connection that you're looking for, and ultimately will make you more memorable to the interviewers and increase your chances for success as well. Mm. To be human. We forget that when we're nervous. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, as well, something I didn't mention in the previous answer, but you forget that the interviewers sometimes are quite nervous. In their day-to-day -day job, they might not be meeting lots and lots of people, and they might only recruit staff maybe once every year, once every couple of years, so they're not very practiced interviewers as well. In fact, quite often, probably the job seeker is going to more interviews more frequently mm -hmm. than the interviewers are doing. So it's not as if they have all the answers and, and you don't. Actually, you're probably feeling a little bit more at ease than they are sometimes. Um, they might not be as well prepared as they could be. Mm -hmm. They might not be the most natural people people to work with. And you know, you 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 need to come across on a personal level and, and maybe just make them feel at ease as well because they might also be just as nervous as you are. I never thought of that thought that before. <laughs> you're too consumed in yourself. That's why when you're in an interview. <laughs> All right, um, I'll move on to the uh, next question, which is again a video question. Uh, this is from Cheryl in Hong Kong. Hi, I'm Cheryl from Hong Kong. So far as I know, employers may conduct 
interviews in various forms, for example, individuals or even group discussions or case study interviews. Therefore, I would like to ask, what should I be prepared before attending these different kinds of interviews? Thank you. Okay, um, Cheryl in Hong Kong asks uh, this question because I suppose it's quite typical in Hong Kong to hold various types of interviews, individual, group, or maybe even case study interviews. So do you have any advice of how a candidate can prepare for these types of different interviews? Um, my advice would be that in the preparation stage, your preparation probably shouldn't be too different for the different types of interviews. And the points that I was talking about earlier can probably quite well suit a face-to-face -face sort of one-to-one -one interview. They could suit a panel interview. They could suit a telephone interview. The basic tips are not so different. Uh, but I think when you are interviewing with a group or a panel, there are a few things that you can try to keep in mind. Um, you need to think about the fact that you're addressing more than one person and not always address your answers directly to the person who's asked them. But it's a good idea to occasionally look and get eye contact with the other panel members, throw some answers more in their direction and try to get them a little bit more involved in the discussion so that it doesn't become quite so one to one to one, but you're trying to facilitate a little bit more of a group type of discussion. Um, there's obviously a little bit more research that you need to do on the point that Amy raised. If you're meeting more than one person, then you want to research into more than one person's background and you want to make sure that you know who all of the different people in the panel are. So maybe your research or your preparation takes a little bit more depth in that area. Um, but actually, for the different types of interview, not so much. Mm -hmm. The one thing that we do a lot of in, in the British Council, because people are interviewing from different locations a lot, we do a lot of telephone interviewing. And the preparation you want to do for that is maybe a little bit different. So you want to make sure that you're in a space where you can speak freely, where you have some good telephone uh, network coverage, and where you're not going to be disturbed. Those things are really crucial for a telephone interview, which sometimes isn't as easy as a face-to-face -face interview because you're not able to use the non-verbal communication that you would when you're meeting with them in person. It can be a little bit easier for misunderstandings to occur and the conversation can sometimes be a little bit more challenging. So you want to prepare a little bit differently for a telephone interview and you probably want to make sure that you take your communication a tiny bit slower, that you leave space for the questions to come back and forth a little bit more naturally and you want to address the people differently in the telephone um, than you do face to face. Yeah, just on the telephone because I do a lot of I do a lot of telephone interviews. I think watching your tone um, as well is important. So a lot of the times people will say, oh, I'm really enthusiastic, but they're very monotone. So just having some amount, if they can't see any personality in you from face to face, if you can try to kind of either like sit up straight or smile when you're speaking um, to have a little bit of, of, an, of an indication of, of that personality there too. Yeah, but actually in terms of the preparation itself, I really don't think that the approach you take needs to be too different. Again, it's just about knowing yourself and your own your own background, your own CV very well, and being able to talk someone through that confidently. Maybe whether you, you enlist a family friend or even if you just talk to Teddy in the corner of the room <laughs> and go through the kind of examples that you're going to give and get used to verbalizing them, get used to talking about the company, read about them in the news, look at the role profile of the job that you're going for. Those things are going to be exactly the same, whether you're going for individual group, case study or whatever. Did you practice with Teddy for the British Council interview? Oh, every time, every time. <laughs> okay, um, Christine in uh, Nigeria asks about aptitude tests before an interview. What is it and what are employers looking for? Why is this maybe quite common now to do an aptitude test? So aptitude tests, I've been through some aptitude testing when I was going for jobs earlier in my career, maybe more in the graduate schemes, because I think that those are quite common. Mm -hmm. And I was doing aptitude tests around um, reasoning, around language skill, around mathematical skill. And to be honest, I think those kind of tests and, and those kind of selection criteria 
they're really trying to whittle down the field as much as they can before they get to the face-to-face -face interview rounds because those face-to-face -face interviews can be so time consuming and they, they just may not be able to cope with the volume of applicants that they're getting and so they're trying to introduce a standardized test that is able to be done from distance and which is going to um, unfortunately is going to result in a, in a decent number of people failing and not getting through to the next round based on their scores. But I think that it's just a sign that you're going for a job or a, a, maybe a graduate scheme perhaps that is very highly sought after and that you're, you're going to have to beat that many more people in order to get to it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in the way you should go about them is as honest as possible. So don't sit there and try to think of what they, you think they want to know. You have to answer it as honestly as possible for yourself um, as well. So I know a lot of them ask the same question just different ways. So that way, that way when you have to read them, you read them correctly and answer them as honestly as possible because otherwise two, two down, you're going to get asked the same question just a different way. So you want to be consistent with how you're answering them. Uh, sometimes they're personality tests as well, and again, you can't really fudge those. You have to answer as, as yeah. honest as possible. In fact, I would always say with any kind of personality test, it's so crucial that you are as honest as you can be because you don't know what the right and the wrong answers are that they're looking for, or even if there are any right or wrong answers. Mm -hmm. So by giving a slightly false impression of yourself, you might be ruling yourself out of the job, whereas if you'd been honest, actually, you could have, you could have gone through and passed. And ultimately, if you're looking for the job, there's always the pressure of the job search and you want to be as successful as you can be because you, you want the opportunity that's on hand. But at the same time, you also need to think that you're looking to start a career in that particular company and you want to ultimately end up somewhere where you are going to be happy. You are going to be able to be yourself and to settle in as well as possible. So really by not being honest during an interview or not being honest in a, an assessment test or anything at all like that, you're not doing yourself any great favors over the longer term and, and it can actually trip you up. So I would think that that's good advice for the whole of the process. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, backtracking a little bit, uh, Juan wants to know uh, if you have any specific tips about Skype interviews. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, yeah, getting connected with the person before the interview making sure you're somewhere with a really strong internet connection um, so that you don't waste the first five or ten minutes of your interview slot going through technical problems. This is something which I find all the time with Skype and also telephone interviews is people just aren't as prepared as they could be and I think whenever you are needing to use technology in your interview you want to go through a dummy run or you maybe want to test it with a friend before the interview time and make sure that you leave another five or so minutes before the interview is due to begin to really get yourself set up because technology can go wrong in so many ways when you're doing an interview. Yeah, and I think making sure everything on your desktop is cleared off so you don't have Messenger up or you don't have any way for other people to be contacting you or things popping up um, so you're completely in tune with that person um, and not forgetting that they can see you. <laughs> yeah, and also I've had friends of mine that have done Skype interviews and it's at a stupid time of the day yeah. and you know family members are going behind with their breakfast cereal or their, in their pajamas exactly. or whatever you need to make sure that you clear <laughs> the area as much as you yeah. can before you're going to do a Skype interview I think for sure <laughs> do you ever test if they're you know fully clothed sometimes they're just wearing their shorts or something like tell them to stand up I, oh. I'm 100% sure that happens all the time they definitely yeah. sometimes don't have yeah. pants on <laughs> 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 Juan, I hope that answered your question. We also have more materials on week four about Skype interviews. Um, okay, well, we're going to move on to another question now. Uh, why are interviewers so interested in hearing about candidates' weaknesses? First part of the question. The second one, do you usually hear the same types of weaknesses? Okay, for, so for first part, they want to make sure that someone's self-aware, that they know they're not perfect. So I'm able to identify what my weaknesses are, or how, what my developmental areas are, I don't like the word weaknesses, and what steps I'm willing to take to address them or to develop long-term, what I might think is a challenge in the job that it comes through. Um, and then the second part, what was the second part again? Uh, do you hear similar types of weaknesses, um, but maybe said in a different yeah, way? <laughs> yeah, I think earlier the ones that, the cliche ones that I said where I take on too much or things like that, um, I think those are often ones that I would hear a lot of. So my advice on the weaknesses 
question would be answer it authentically, like what you actually think going into that job, what you could, you know, you're not 100% there yet. It's not 100% of strength yet, but it's on your way there and you're able to identify one, what it is and two, how you're able to work with it day to day. Yeah, I think so. And, and it, the interview is most likely you're being interviewed by the future line manager. So the person's going to need to manage you, is going to need to spend eight or nine hours a day in the office with you for the next however many months or years. And I think people just generally need to know what they're getting into when they hire you and they manage you. Mm -hmm. And if you are self-aware and you're able to show a little bit of humility when you talk about your own weaknesses, and you talk about how you make efforts to address those weaknesses, I think it just makes people feel that much more confident and comfortable about you and, you know, and, and confident that you're going to be someone that they're happy to spend that amount of time with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's just a very humanizing type of question. And the fact is that we all have weaknesses. Absolutely. And if you know about them, and if you are able to show proactivity in the way that you deal with them, then that's already putting you above a, a decent proportion of the people out there, yeah. I would say. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think as long as you're able to identify them, not change them into a positive, but like be able to say, again, how you're managing them and not just, you know, flat out, I'm really terrible at this and that's all there is to it. It's I identify I'm terrible at this, but this is how I'm going around getting better at it. Um, can you tell me a bizarre weakness someone has mentioned or something that just completely turned you off? <laughs> Do you remember any? Or, or has there been any? Oh, Good question. Great question. Like, I, I can't wake up on time or something? <laughs> Uh, I've given, oh, enough, I have the I've given that answer in an interview. I've told the interviewers that I'm very poor at timekeeping. And because, but the plus side was that it was an interview with a hospital that was around the corner from my house. And so I was turning that into a positive as to why I was so suitable to work there it was because, well, for me, I, you know, somewhere that's close by is, is that much easier for me, but you've got one. So yeah, I have actually, I have a friend of mine who is a talent director at a law firm and they were doing their associate recruitment and um, they asked this question, like, what is your weakness? And the, the fellow said, I'm really terrible. I'm not, I can never make it on time. I'm not punctual at all. And they were like, well, what do you mean? And he went on to explain that in, he's asked partners to change morning meetings or clients to change morning meetings because he actually just can't get there. And he wants them after lunch. So at that point, you're kind of, you're just, He's not managing it. He's not fixing it. He's not giving a solution on how he can develop better. Uh, he's just flat out saying, I, I'm not, I'm terrible at being there and I won't. <laughs> Did he get the job? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't give him a chance. <laughs> he was honest, at least, I guess. So two of the same answers. <laughs> yeah. But you swung yeah. yours. <laughs> I swung mine. Yeah, I actually, this was much, much earlier in my career. That was good. When I maybe didn't have so many weaknesses to bring up because I just never worked anywhere before. Um, and that was actually a weakness that I used. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it, but on that occasion, it, it, it still worked out You're for me. You're super punctual now. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> Practice makes progress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, next question is, um, when interviewers ask, how will you fit into our culture? Obviously, they've done a bit of research online, but you can't quite know the culture. What do, you, what do uh, interviewers actually mean, or what type of answers are they looking for? I think the, uh, the short answer, again, is an honest answer, because every organization does have such different cultural ways, and they have their own little idiosyncrasies about that place that make it what it is to work there. And that might be because of the type of personalities that are there. It might be because the organization is uh, a Japanese company or an American company, for example, or a French company. and once you've been in industry and when you've worked at places for a little while, there might be things about the company culture that you can guess. And you might imagine that, okay, this particular company, I think that their culture is a certain way. But the fact is that until you work somewhere, you never truly know what the company culture is going to be like. Um, and also when you go to work somewhere, you are going to have a little bit of an impact on that company culture. So the company culture in that office when you go to work there might not necessarily be the same as it is right now when you're not working there. Mm -hmm. So you can't really 100% know about the way that things are there unless you know someone or speak to someone who is currently there and is able to give you a very, very detailed description. So 99% of the time, you just can't know. 
And so I think the only way that you really can answer this sort of question is honestly by talking about yourself, by talking about the type of environment where you feel the happiest and where you are best able to contribute. So you might be someone who is a little bit introverted, you might be someone who's very extroverted or, or so on. You might be a real people person who's happy working with people from all different walks, in which case that's something that you want to make a big deal of maybe in the interview section that we're talking about. But I think as much as possible, be very open about the kind of environment that you're most comfortable in and the kind of places that you've worked before that have worked well for you. But at the same time, I would also try to emphasize a little bit about your own flexibility and not try to come across as someone who works super well in one particular type of environment. Because the chances are that this place that you're going to work isn't quite like that in one way or another. So you need to balance this between what I just mentioned, being as honest as possible and also reminding them that you're coming into a new place, you're aware that you're going to have to adapt and you're going to have to make time to get to know the people there, get to know the ways of doing things, get to know the senior management style and so on, and just basically show as much willingness as possible. I think that's the best way to go about tackling this kind of question. Mm -hmm. So maybe there more looking for your personality and how you would see yeah. it from from your okay, own perspective. Yeah. And it comes back to the same point that we made before, you know, that the manager is, is looking for someone who's going to stick around for a while and isn't going to be uncomfortable in the company that they're looking to recruit for. So they're not they're probably, I mean, they might be trying to hype up the company culture to make it sound super great because they really want to bring you on board because they just need someone to take up this job as much as possible. That does happen quite a lot. Um, or it might be that they are not giving you very much information at all about the company culture. And, and, and so you're going to have to do a little bit more digging of them because they're not sharing that information very, very forthcomingly. Um, but I mean, you know, ultimately, you're going to try to get as clear an idea as you can about the company culture, and they want to make sure that whoever they're bringing in is going to be happy there, is going to stick around for a decent period of time, and isn't going to leave after one or two months. So they should give you as much information as you need, but you may need to do a little bit of digging, and you may need to tailor your answers to what you're hearing from them. So would it be okay to flip the question if they asked, um, how would you fit into our culture? Could you ask them a bit about, well, what's the culture like here? Would yeah. that be acceptable? Uh, answering a question with a question, that, that would be, uh, if you're going for any type of job, that would be probably quite acceptable. And if you're going for a sales or a business development type job, that sort of information gathering is sales technique 101. Yeah. So whenever you're trying to sell something, what you want to find out, first of all, is about the customer's needs and desires and so on. And, and information gather as much as you can before you sell a proposition back to them. And what you're doing in that sort of answer is exactly that. You're trying to find out what the company culture is like so that you can then tell them back how you're going to be the best fit for it. So actually that sort of answer I think is, is quite a positive one. Um, so how about if an interviewer asks, what if you woke up one morning and found an elephant in your backyard, what would you do? <laughs> can I, could you I ask what would you do? Yeah. <laughs> I, I know there are companies that will ask these kind of questions or maybe they'll also ask you really obscure, really difficult to answer questions. What they're looking for most of the time is not necessarily the originality of your answer or, or the particular answer that you give. It's more about how are you rationalizing that answer? How are you coming up with it? So if you just shoot from the hip and give them the first thing that comes to the top of your mind in this sort of slightly offbeat question, that might not be the best way. What you probably would want to do is just take a second, think about the situation, think about how are you going to interact and what's the impact going to be and, and try to show some reasoning or some patterning behind your, your answer. It's like in, in school when you're given a maths question, they don't just want to know what the answer to the algebra question is, but they want to be able to see you're working and see the kind of steps that you're going through. I think sometimes when you face these kind of crazy questions in the interview, that's also what they're hoping to see from you. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, yeah. Have you ever been asked any kind of questions like that any weird questions like that i was one of my previous bosses asked me how many ping pong balls would you fit into this interview room <laughs> and uh, and i looked at him like he was crazy but 
then you think about, okay, so what are the dimensions of the room? I think that the room is yeah. three meters by 20 meters and by 10, you know, three meters tall. So therefore I can work out the, the cubic room volume yeah. and then I can work out what a ball is and then I can try to divide the two and whatever the answer is, that would be my answer to you. Yeah, we had one, um, I worked for a professional services firm in Canada and they used to like to ask questions similar to that just to kind of work out your thought process. So. One was, how many ties do you think are sold in Canada a year? So then they're not looking for an answer, like a proper answer. They're just looking for you to say, okay, well, the population of Canada is this. This is how many men there are. This is how many ties I think that it is. And just to see how you can whittle down. Um, and sometimes they just want to see what kind of reaction you're going to have to that. Mm. And the other thing as well is, is testing your thought process and your consistency under pressure. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of companies deliberately use role plays that you cannot see in advance of the interview to test how are you going to behave or how are you going to react to this problem that you are faced with on the day itself and how are you going to overcome that kind of pressure. I think you know, interviewers sometimes are deliberately trying to raise the temperature a little bit and just see how it is that you react. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people might walk out of the room after they're asked this question. <laughs> some, yeah, some people might, but then those people aren't going to get the job. Yeah. And, and it, that kind of resilience and that, that consistency is what you're looking for. There's another example. I was working with a shipping company. Uh, I was, they were one of my clients. And in their interview process, they would put people under a very, very intense and very difficult test which was time pressured. So you'd have to answer maybe 60 questions in 20 minutes. And so each question is very, very, very time sensitive. And what they wanted to test was, do your answers become more erratic as time goes on and the pressure increases? And this was designed to show that in a sales situation or when the pressure is on from the management, is this person's behavior going to change? Is it become more unpredictable? Is it going to become less ethical? Are they more inclined to lie when they're heavily under pressure? So some companies really take this to the extreme and they really deliberately put you under slightly uncomfortable situations to see how similar are your thoughts and actions in those circumstances versus the everyday calm persona that you're putting across more normally and then to try and compare the two. So some companies are quite advanced and quite quite tricky to deal with when, when this kind of thing is concerned. Uh, I'll keep that in mind for my next interview. <laughs> Sorry, Adam. <laughs> um, okay, another video question here. Uh, Christine in Nigeria. Hello, my name is Christine Abarungo. And I wish to ask this question. If an interviewer asks, why should we hire you? What exactly are they expecting us to give them, given the fact that I've gone through our CV? Could you also please give us steps to answer this question? Thank you. Okay, Christine in Nigeria said, okay, so interviewers have already read your, uh, a candidate's CV and decided that yes, they are good enough uh, for an interview. Yet interviewers still ask, why should we hire you? What are they actually looking for? And what are some steps a candidate could take to answer this question? Um, I think the thing to remember is the CV and the supporting statement that you've written are really only the first step. They're the ticket that's going to get you through the door to interview. And you really can't take it for granted that managers are going to have read every word of your CV and your supporting statement. And you really can't take it for granted too much that you're going to be successful on the basis of those things. Really, at the interview, you're building on all of that and you're trying to show more of your personality and you're really trying to bring that CV to life a lot more and make it stick in the minds of the interviewers and, and really demonstrate to them as to why you're suitable. And I think this kind of question where they ask, right, so very much, why should I hire you? This is a very open question. It's deliberately open to your own interpretation. You can take it in a hundred different ways and they're really testing how you respond, how are you answering that question under some pressure? And I think what interviewers are looking for most of the time when they ask, when they ask this kind of question is, 
for a very succinct, very memorable, short and sharp sales pitch for yourself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, B, when we were talking before, you talked about people in Hong Kong really having their one minute pitch or their elevator pitch honed to perfection in Hong Kong. And that that's a real part of the business culture there is that people are able to summarize and sell themselves in a very succinct manner. And I think that's what this sort of question is getting at at the interview. The managers, bear in mind, they're going to be interviewing maybe four or five or even as many as ten interviewees for that particular job over those couple of days. And believe it or not, once the interviews are finished or even sometimes during that process, their memories are going to get hazy as to exactly who was who, who was strong, who was not, and they're going to have to go back and remind themselves using their notes. Their own memories are not going to be perfect. And what they're looking for from that sort of question is an excuse to hire you and a way that they are going to remember you amongst all of the other people that they've met during that process that is going to just pinpoint why are you the one and they're trying to make their own lives a little bit easier in the process by just giving as, as clear an answer as possible and I think if someone is not able to succinctly sell themselves and not able to summarize in a very clear very calm and very minimalist way as to why they are suitable for that particular job it might be that they are not very suitable and that's why they're struggling to answer it it might be that they have not prepared very well in knowing their own background, so they're not able to summarize that background very clearly. Or it might just be that they haven't done the research about the job itself and they're not able to tie their own experience to the needs of the job in a very clear and easy way. So if someone doesn't answer in such a clear and such a concise manner, that's a real indicator to me that the person isn't so great. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you answer this question in the ways that we've just talked about, that's a real surefire way of making yourself more memorable in the person's yeah. mind and just hammering home your, your key selling points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. It's sort of envisioning yourself in the job already and then being able to, to say back, well, of course, you'd want me on my team and here's why. So I think those are really good points. Mm. Again, more of your personality and preparation shining through. Yeah. yeah. And that's the, the you're dealing ultimately with people. You, you're you're trying to liven up their day because interviewing six or seven people in a day isn't fun. Mm -hmm. um, it can be tiring. It can be stressful. And like I said, they can also be really nervous about it. So just by being as, as human as possible in giving this kind of answer, you're really going to be making their day that bit easier, that bit brighter. And again, that's only going to be in your favor when they come to make their decisions at the end of it as well. Mm -hmm. So tell your story, an amazing story, in two minutes. What about if somebody took five minutes? Would that be too much? Not necessarily. I mean, if someone's story and their background are really that fantastic, or if you're going for a job where you have so much experience that is relevant, then there's, you know, there's no reason why your, your pitch shouldn't go on for that little bit longer. And it's the same with CVs. People sometimes say to me, well, I heard that my CV should be no longer than one page of A4 or two sides of A4. And my answer is always, well, why? If, if you've got relevant experience, why would you cut it off just to make your CV that bit shorter? I think employers don't want to go through loads of waffle and they don't want to cut through unnecessary information. But if something's relevant, then for sure put it in your pitch. Yeah, and oftentimes throughout the interview, you might not have talked about a skill that you might have had that you might want to highlight at that time. Um, so it might not have been covered within the, the questions area, and it's time for you to bring that up. Where mm -hmm. you know we haven't talked about it, but it's just so you know, this is also another skill I'm able to bring to yeah. the table. And that's the, equally the case because in the in the setup, the interviewers they might not have thought about certain things, or there might be areas that you can bring that are completely outside of the job scope, which they would never have thought about, and which actually would bring a lot of value to the business that you're going to apply for. And so this is a good time to talk about the things that are important to you, as well as the things that that you are really strong at and if if I've run out of material when I'm kind of answering this kind of question I might just use that that section or maybe the question section at the end if I've already exhausted all of the questions that I have to ask uh, to ask I might just use that opportunity to really reiterate my keenness for the job why it is so important to me and just go on your your motivations as much as anything else so if you really cannot think about why you're suitable talk about the strength of your feelings for the job and how much it fits in with your longer term career plans why you think you'd be happy and why ultimately you'd make a good employee for those reasons that's that's a, a good backup a good backup plan to have um, what are three 
questions you prepare for, if you can remember. <laughs> what are what are usual two or three questions you usually prepare and answer for? I I mean you're always going to be asked what do you think are going to be the key challenges in this job? So that's something which I would always, always prepare for. In, and, and what interviewers are wanting to know when they ask you this is they want to test your awareness and your understanding of the job. They want to really see that you've thought through what is this job actually going to be like when I finally take it up? And then how am I going to go about taking those challenges on? Because ideally, I mean, that you're, what you're going to answer when you're answering that kind of question is you're going to give the kind of challenges that your manager is facing on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis. And so they really are looking for ideas of how to challenge them or just at least an understanding that when you come in, you're not going to be shocked by the problems that you find. So I would always prepare for that question. I would always prepare for a 30, 60, 90 day plan. So it's similar to what your challenges would be, but it's breaking them up into your first priorities once you get in there the first month, which is a lot about building relationships and learning the landscape. The second month would be a little bit more about learning a bit more about the business and what your job's going to entail. And then the third, you should be, you know, hitting the ground running and actually contributing to the yeah. team. So having an answer prepared for that. 100%. And if I had to give a third one, I would say maybe the, the, it's a very, very cliche question, but where do you see yourself in five years' time, ten years' time, whatever? The, the fact of the matter is, on average, you're probably not going to be in this job yes. still in five years' time. So this question is off the bat already kind of a false question. Certainly in Singapore, the practice is that people will be moving jobs every two or three years on average. And I think the interviewers also know this. But nonetheless, they still ask this question. And I think you want to use this answer to give an idea of your longer term career goals and how they fit with the job that you're interviewing for at that moment in time. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that you answer it by saying, I see myself in your seat doing your job. Yeah, yeah that's, um, that's a little... That's, that's a bit yeah. cheesy. It is a bit cheesy. And also, do not <laughs> talk about your personal life either. So I've had candidates where they wanted, they told me what they envisioned in their in their personal life so they wanted to be married or have kids or have a boyfriend or something where you're kind of not it's not the time to be talking about it um so yeah, yeah. I, i'd answer this question in as clear a, a way as possible just just give them your career plan or your, what you hope in mind for your career and tie it in with the job that you're interviewing for and, and then just try to cut the answer at there and then um, because ultimately the interviewers themselves probably know that that question is a little bit false. Mm. And just now that we're on a, a sort of still on preparing for um, different questions, I would think if we could think of the end of the interview where you're preparing for questions for them. So when they, when you get to the spot where they are asking, do you have any questions? Never say no. So always come prepared with at least five legit, legitimate questions about the industry or the company or where they see the role going or what the challenges they think are in the role. So think of really good, strong questions for it. Um, one of my biggest tips for interviews at the end is asking the interviewer at the end of, of the meeting you just had if what concerns they have with you in the role, um, because sometimes you'll get some honesty and then you're able to kind of alleviate some of the, their concerns that they have right there and then mm -hmm. without having to wait for feedback to come through. That's really good advice. I just wrote that one down in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and also it shows a little bit of confidence in yourself um, because they're not prepared for such, yeah. such questions. What I wouldn't do is go one step further and say, so have I got the job? Yeah. Or, you know, when can I expect to hear from you? Yeah. This is not the kind of question that is appropriate to ask at the end of the interview because the interviewers don't know yet. They yeah. haven't had a chance to discuss amongst themselves. They haven't met all of the people that they're going to meet. So yeah. you're putting them on the spot there and, and that's yeah. a little bit unprofessional. So don't, mm -hmm. don't be too leading with your questions at the end. Yeah. But definitely that's a nice way of phrasing it. Just so do yeah. you have any concerns about seeing me in this particular job. And I just, I have a personal experience where it was useful where I was interviewing for a role that was a higher level role um, within my team. And I was interviewing with a director who didn't have any lined, like day to day sight of what I did. She just knew what I was able to produce through her, my direct manager. And so when I got to her, she didn't really know much about my background just hearsay of what I've been doing in the company. So at the end of our interview, I asked her, is there any concerns that you have in my role and with me being in this role? And she w gave me honest feedback of just not knowing me so well. And then we were able to kind of talk about, about why I would be suitable. And it was successful. So yeah. um, it, was a, it was a good question. I also, just to elaborate on those points a little bit more as well, I wouldn't also use the 
question section at the end of an interview to go into too much personal detail around um, well, can you accommodate certain holiday dates? Or, you know, my, my plan might be to, to, to try for a baby in three months or something. And can that be accommodated within the company's um, HR benefits and so on? Those sort of questions might be in the back of your mind, but it would be far more appropriate to raise those questions later in the process. Maybe once you've found out that you are successful and you're talking to the HR about the onboarding process, things like that, mm. that would be the time when you are in a much stronger position to bring up those kind of nitty gritty details and not so much in the interview. Yeah. The interview is really about assessing whether this person's suitable or not, not so much for hammering out the fine point um, as, as those. Yeah, that's good. Um, would it be possible to ask for the job towards the end of the interview just to kind of show your passion to say, do you think I'm no, qualified? I'd really like to work for you. Uh, no. I'd ease up on that. Yeah. I'd ease up. I think it's, it's, it is okay to say that you are interested and to reaffirm your interest and in, in why you're interested in the role, but just to say, you know, thank you for your time and just so you know, I'm very interested in the role and I look forward to hearing from you in due course. Um, but not saying, do I have it is not suitable at that time. Okay. So show your passion, but don't ask. <laughs> 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 okay. I'll move on to the next question, um, which I think many people kind of fall into this from time to time. What would you consider a good reason uh, for a person to have been unemployed for one to two years? And how would you respond if you were in this situation? Or sometimes maybe they may not even pick up the CV and, you know, once they see a gap, is that, okay, oh, sorry, first part of the question is if you pick up a CV and they have been unemployed for a few years, what would you think? Uh, would you even call them up for an interview? And if you were in this situation, what would be good reasons? Yeah, I think we often look, gaps are sort of, if you are going to be in looking at resumes every day, uh, one of the 101s for looking at resumes is gaps and why. Um, so it doesn't prevent me from calling somebody, but I will ask questions as to why. So if it was a one to two year, you'll often ask, okay, well, I see there's some time between jobs. Can you tell me, you know, what you were doing within that time? And I think suitable reasons could be like a mat leave or a sickness or um, some issues with your family or school. You went you furthered education. Uh, maybe you went traveling and you enriched yourself some way. Um, but not having a reason is is often a red flag. But if they're able to provide reasons, you know, where they had some commitments or were able to demonstrate growth, it's okay. Yeah. One thing which I noticed more when I moved to Singapore and started recruiting in Asia versus what I had seen in London is a lot of people will take time out of their careers to look after family members, maybe who are older or not so well. Um, a lot of people will take some time out to help with a family business. And if that isn't related to the, to the kind of career that they've been following beforehand, then maybe they don't put that on their CV because they don't see it as so relevant to that particular type of job. So sometimes I do need to do a little bit of digging and find out about those things. And those are all absolutely fine as well. I think no one is, is going to make a big issue about those reasons. And something to be aware of is, is about the industry that you're going to apply to join. So if you're applying for jobs in some banks, for example, or maybe some government sector jobs where the pre-employment screening is going to be very, very rigorous and employers are going to have to explain gaps in your CV going back several years, even if the gap is only one or two months, you may have to produce some justification for that, maybe even a reference for that period of time when you were not working, someone to verify the reason as to why not. In some industries, they're extremely thorough and they will really look for that level of background detail in your resume and in your application supporting statement. So I think just be aware of the, the kind of company that you're looking to join and try and get a sense of how thorough they're going to be in their background checking. And then just make sure that you're able to provide as much documentation and supporting evidence as they need. That's all. That's usually after the interview. It's normally in the reference checking and pre-employment stage. But it's definitely something to bear in mind. Some employers will look into this area much, much more thoroughly than some others. And so you want to be able to just explain and justify very honestly and not 
cloud the dates, not lie about the dates, or maybe try to add one or two months onto a job at the beginning and then at the end so that you close the gaps up. Yeah. That can actually be quite dangerous, and depending on the company that you go to join, that can actually catch you. Right. Absolutely. Or, you know, you filled out an application with the dates on one and your resume says something different and then your LinkedIn profile is something different. It will all come out in the wash in one and then it will raise some more red flags. So be consistent with your date. The only areas that I think are really, really challenging to answer for are times when you've been out of work for a year or two and you have been looking for work during that time and you've either you've not been looking for the right types of work or you haven't been doing it in a very proactive way and so you don't really have any any firm reason it's just that you were looking and you weren't successful that can be a little bit challenging for people to explain at an interview and it can can maybe raise some question marks in the interviewer's mind so it's important that you you kind of tackle the reasons why you were finding it very tough or maybe you were looking in a certain area area of work and you you realized after four or five months that it just wasn't happening and just wasn't suitable and so you had to compromise and look at another type of career that was more attainable for you that's no problem but you would have to address that and you would have to talk through that because if you just leave that hanging or as an uncertainty in the employers minds then that may be something that they could look upon with some difficulty um, I've had one experience in my recruitment career of representing someone who had done jail time for two years and had lied about that on their CV. And when it came to the pre-employment check process, because that was working for a bank, the bank was very thorough in its, in its outsourced reference checking, and that did come up. Yeah. And the fact that the gentleman had lied about the fact that he'd been to jail for, I think, a two-year period, um, it caused a lot of problems for him and yeah. for me right. and I really really would um, urge caution before you try to cover up anything that's serious in your track record you really need to think twice because that can cause you to lose a job even after you have exactly. been hired if yeah. the company then finds out down the line that you lied about your CV and provided false references or something was not right about the information that you gave they can withdraw the job offer retrospectively and it can cause you to lose your job there yeah. and then so as much as that's a challenging thing to have to admit to as well um, you are better off sometimes honest. judging the situation and being yeah. honest about yeah. that even as severe a case yeah. as that yeah. Because sometimes companies will will think the honesty is, well, at least they were upfront and honest about yes. it and we didn't find out after the fact. Yeah. So they could still give you the chance. We yeah. had a really recent case like that yeah. in the British Council and the reason that we had to retract the offer from the person was because they had lied consistently through the application process right. and not necessarily because they had done something not so nice in their past. Mm -hmm. Okay, a few more questions. Um, Juan wants to know uh, if you have any tips for non-Asians to be employed in Asia. So we're both quite good examples of that, I guess. Uh, Amy's worked in Asia for many years and I've been here for about five years, so we've both done it. Um, I think when I am recruiting people coming to Asia for the first time, what you're looking for is, is just an awareness of some of the cultural difficulties, not cultural difficulties, but the cultural differences as compared to where they previously came from. So if they're coming from a Western company environment, you're looking for them to show awareness of um, the fact that you know relationships here are so important and I know that these are maybe slightly cliched examples but the fact that you're one-to-one -one dealing with people has to be that little bit different mm -hmm. you have to spend a lot of time and invest time getting to know people and and the niceties may be a little bit more important whereas if you're working and living in London for example it can be a little bit colder a little bit harder a little bit more uh, agenda driven mm -hmm. and uh, and direct whereas that kind of direct approach maybe in in Singapore certainly isn't going to give you as much success in business mm -hmm. and I think just an awareness of the slight cultural differences to the company that you're particularly living in. I think also being a specialist in your industry also helps when you're coming into another country um, because if you, if you, it's a little bit harder if you don't have any experience coming into a foreign country in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think both of us were recruiters for a very long time and had not a terribly difficult time um, coming to Singapore. I think being super adaptable is also important and being able to demonstrate that you are that why you want to be in that country um, is important as well because oftentimes especially in Singapore it's quite transient so people come in and, and then leave um, so we want to know you know that they're looking for a commitment as well 
um, when they're coming here and not just going to you know come in for a couple of months and, and head out again yeah and a willingness a, a genuine willingness to really adapt get to know the place that they're working and not bring their old lifestyle across so much but actually make an effort to you know, get to know people and and uh, get to know the different way of life and just take advantage of living in a new place this is the kind of proactive and, and positive mindset that we're looking for maybe when we're interviewing people coming out to asia because lots and lots and lots of people do want to come and work here what differentiates those who are maybe more successful at it is are they willing to come over and interview face to face? So will they will they spend their own money to fly themselves here and attend interviews in person, rather than are they just going to stay at home and do it and insist that it all be in their time zone, for example? And and this kind of willingness and this kind of seriousness mm -hmm. is is uh, really important, I think, from separating you from the thousands of other people who think that working in Asia is going to be great, which it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Juan, I hope that was a good answer for you. I know Juan has been around Asia for a few times and he's looking to come back, that's why. <laughs> ah, well then, Juan's in a good position already because he can talk about how successful he's been in the past and how aware he is yeah. of the, the, the differences between different cultures and how he's adapted so well in the past. He can draw on a lot of experience which others can't, so I think he'd be in a good, a good position good, to do yeah. that, yeah. Okay. Hope you took notes, Juan. Um, okay, is it okay we have a few more questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, this next one will be a video question again, uh, Christine in Nigeria. Hello, my question is, if you were asked in an interview, what is your salary expectation? And you actually don't know how much they pay people for the position you're applying for. What are the possible ways of answering that question? Thank you. Okay, so what Christine in Nigeria asks is, how should a candidate answer the question, what is your salary expectation? Especially if you don't actually know the salary range or what would be a smart way to answer? Okay, um, the first thing I would say is that before the interview, you really want to try and get an idea of what the salary range is for that particular job. Um, so companies don't always advertise it when they post up the adverts for the job. They might not be very open about what the salary is, maybe because it's commercially sensitive and they don't want their rivals to know what they're paying for certain jobs, or maybe because the salary is genuinely going to be very flexible depending on the experience of the person who takes it up. And so they want to leave themselves a bit of negotiation room to offer slightly more to someone who's more experienced but they don't want to advertise a really high salary and then more junior candidates expect that salary when they're successful in being offered the job. So there's a hundred reasons why the company might not make it super obvious what the salary is, but you still want to try and get a rough idea so that your own expectations are as aligned as possible. So ways that you could do that would be maybe to find and to talk to people who've worked for that company before, people who work for different companies but in a similar type of job, and can give you an idea of what the starting salaries are. Um, if in doubt, if you are in a country where there are lots of recruitment agencies working and where they produce salary surveys on a yearly basis, most of the time those are free to access on the internet. So you can look at different industries and you can look at different types of jobs and you can look up what the going rate is for entry level salaries in those companies. Um, you could even work with a recruitment company who would be willing to share with you what the realistic salary should be. So, and they'll, they'll do that for free. If you're willing to talk to them and work with them, they'll do that for absolutely no money at all. So if you invest time before the interview, you really can work out roughly what the salary should be for that type of job. Mm -hmm. So unless the company is massively underpaying or overpaying, you're going to go in with a fairly good rough idea. And so once you have that in your mind, you want to make sure that your own expectations are kind of in line with that. Um, it might be that your cost of living or your commitments mean that you need a slightly higher salary. And so you might want to question whether this is really a job that you should be going for if you know that it isn't going to be quite paying enough to, to interest you over the longer term. Um, but realistically, you want to try and do your homework as much as possible. So this sort of question should never take you 100% by surprise. Um, but that said, when you are asked this question in an interview, I think it's fair to give a vague 
idea of your own expectations. So you might give a slight range or you might give a precise figure, but try to keep it as realistic as possible without underselling yourself. So you don't want to go in super high, which is going to maybe cause them to doubt whether they can afford you. But at the same time, you don't want to undervalue yourself because I can guarantee you that if you give a number or a figure in the interview, which is a little bit lower than your true worth, then you're going to end up with that number as the eventual job offer. And they're not going to offer you more than they think you will accept. Yeah. That is the golden rule when it comes to salary yeah. negotiation. So never undersell yourself, but you don't want to try and overprice yourself either. You want to try and get an idea before the interview of roughly where the sweet spot's going to be. And you want to do an honest assessment of your own cost of living, your own hopes and what you personally find affordable. You also want to maybe look at what your peers are earning, those that graduated with you or those that have worked in similar companies to you. You want to try to get a rough idea of what they're earning and try to make sure that you're roughly in parity with them at least so that you don't feel undervalued further down the line and try to give them as accurate an idea as you can whilst stressing that you are flexible on the eventual figure. So if you go in with a figure that is one or two thousand higher than their budget, if you've stressed that you're keen on the job and that you'll be flexible depending on the overall benefits package, mm -hmm. then you still stand a chance. And it's important to remember that different companies are going to offer different benefits as well and show an awareness of that. So if you're interviewing for a company that you know offers really good annual leave and a really good pension or really good work-life work -life balance, for example, yeah, then you might want to show an awareness of that when you're asked this kind of question and not just make it a hard and fast figure. Because if a company is going to give you great benefits, great freebies, great discounts and great work-life balance, but they're paying $500 less, then probably you're still going to consider it versus the company that has zero benefits, zero bonus, mm -hmm. and yet is going to offer you slightly higher basics. So you want to show a little bit of flexibility and a little bit of awareness about the kind of industry that you're going for. Good answer. Yeah. So if somebody highballed their salary, would you just write them <laughs> off or would you go back to say... If they, I mean, if they're more than, you know, if they're way, way, way above, then yeah, we, we'd find it difficult to go back to that person with an offer. So that's why you want to do your homework beforehand and not pitch yourself so far above that you're going to give them nightmares. But you do want to give a realistic but yeah. promising idea of your expectations. I often think this question comes up in sort of a pre-screen as well. So. Once you're sat down in the interview, oftentimes the, the interviewer will know either where your salary expectations are or what you're currently on in and around. So it shouldn't be a t too big of a surprise once you're too far down the line. Okay. Don't you think? Mm. Yeah. Or if somebody could maybe give us a high range but say it's negotiable depending on the whole package, then you're kind of yeah. safe. Yeah. <laughs> giving a, giving a, a, a tight range is probably a, a, a good piece of advice. Mm -hmm rather than a precise figure because if you give a precise figure then that's probably what they're going to end up giving you and, and chances are you might have been able to get slightly more whereas if you do give a range you give yourself the opportunity during the offer process later to at least go back to them and say is it possible to get 500 more or a thousand dollars more something like that yeah okay um last question and this is along the lines of what you're doing now, what kind of soft skills should we put emphasis on when being interviewed for a language teaching position in an East Asian country? I think this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how people should, what uh, I think, um, I forget his name, but he asked, well, wow. asked the question about how to get um, into Asia. Um, it, cultural awareness will be what we look for straight up. So. Each country is very different, so knowing what your skills would be to, um, say, Vietnamese students might be different than Singaporean students and what. So knowing that your your audience will be a little bit different and being able to be adaptable to both. Um, resilience as well, so coming into the countries, they might be a little bit different as well. So making sure that you're showing them that you're able to be roll with the punches that might come with, with those different countries. Communication skills is a big one. Um, so especially being a teacher, you need to know that your audience is one, your students, and then two, your colleagues. So your communication to students might be a little bit more on the gentle side, and then with your colleagues, you need to be a little bit stronger and show that relationship building skills um, there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, more soft skills needed these days. <laughs> yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> Okay, um,
time we're a bit over time that's all of the questions that we have today thank you so much for forfeiting your work-life balance <laughs> on a Friday <laughs> evening <laughs> um, that's our pleasure yeah thank you uh, for those uh, students who have tuned in if we didn't get to your questions we're very sorry uh, we've taken up lots of uh, time from Matt and Amy so we'll just go ahead and let them go so thank you so much from the English at Work in Asia team and from the thousands of students that are enrolled in this course from all over the world if they didn't get to tune in they'll be able to watch the video back and um, have a discussion on the forums so um, go ahead and enjoy your Friday night we owe you one <laughs> um, enjoy your Friday night in Singapore it's our pleasure and thanks very much for sharing your time as well yeah, I think we we both interview loads of people and, and it's something which not everyone uh, you know feels very very comfortable about but you really should feel confident and you really should feel as comfortable as possible going into an interview you're you're really talking about a subject which you know better than anyone which is yourself and your own background and experience and so you need to remember that the people that you're meeting are on your side and you're hopefully going for a job that you're qualified for and interested in and if that comes across sincerely and clearly then you really stand a great chance so i wish everyone good luck with their yeah. career hunting good luck thank you for your precious time and wisdom <laughs> <laughs> goodbye from hong kong see you good night night